As you watch this teaching, I would like to ask you to please subscribe, like, and comment so more people can see it. My name is Rick Renner, and I'm seated on a cliff above the Dead Sea. That is exactly where God rained fire and brimstone upon the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, an event that we read about in Genesis chapter 19. God had sent an inspection team of two angels to Sodom to see how bad really was the sin of the city. And when the angels saw how bad it was, here is what they said in Genesis chapter 19, verse 13, for we will destroy this place because the cry of them is waxen great before the face of the Lord and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. The destruction is described in verse 24. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven and he overthrew those cities. Now the next morning Abraham got up and the Bible tells us in verse 27, he went to the place where he had stood before the Lord. He went to the place where he had interceded for his nephew Lot. And he looked, this is verse 28, and he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain and beheld and lo, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. It was complete, total destruction. The earth had literally opened up and swallowed these cities and all the cities of the plain. There was nothing left of them. And that is why to this day, this is the lowest place on the planet. There's no geographical place lower than the Dead Sea. And it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow. Lot was not destroyed with the cities because his uncle Abraham had prayed for him. That is the power of a praying person. You can pray for people you know, perhaps that are righteous, but they're not living very righteously. Are they about to experience the repercussions, uh, wrong choices and a bad lifestyle? You can intervene for them. And because of your prayers, they can be delivered from destruction. And that's what I wanna to talk to you about today. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insights and understanding from the Word of God. Here is Rick. This is Rick Renner, and I want to thank you for joining me today. I've been waiting for you. Grab a cup of coffee, get some tea, get something to drink, and grab your Bible, because today we're going to dive into our subject about how to intercede for anyone that is in trouble. In fact, that's the series we're offering you right now. It's a five-part series called How to Intercede for People Who Are in Trouble. It comes in multiple formats with a marvelous study guide. I just love the study guides. Today I brought a sample of a study guide. This particular study guide is the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And when you look through the study guide, my lens, it is just loaded. Look at this on page 23. All the Greek words, the definitions, the points, the principles, the benefits of being filled with the Spirit. Every single study guide we offer is like this. They really are treasures for you to use personally or to share with a friend. And they're great for a guide for a Bible study group. And we're also offering you Denise's little book that is just powerful, which is called The Gift of Forgiveness. If you need to be forgiven, this is for you. If you need to give the gift of forgiveness to somebody else, this is also for you. It will set you free if you'll forgive. This is just a tremendous book. But it's such a pleasure to be with you. And remember, if you need prayer, we're here for you. We believe that God wants to deliver anyone that is in trouble. And today we're going to show this to you from Scripture. So grab your Bible and let's today turn to 2 Peter chapter 2, where Peter comments on the deliverance that occurred for Lot when he was in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And when you come to 2 Peter chapter 2, Peter is talking about the judgment of God. And he particularly talks about the judgment that fell on Sodom and Gomorrah. And his words are just amazing. It's a real commentary on this Old Testament event. So let's go there. 2 Peter chapter 2. And today we're going to begin in verse 6. Peter writes, 
and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly. Verse 7, and delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. There was Lot, a just man, the Bible says that, the Greek word dikaios, it's the New Testament word for righteousness. There was Lot, a just man, a righteous man, living in the midst of sin and not living very righteously. You may know someone like that. It may be your spouse. It may be a parent. It may be a child. Maybe a grandchild. Maybe a friend or a co-worker. It might even be someone who used to walk with God and go to church with you, and now they've strayed and they're righteous, but they're not living very righteously. In fact, they're making catastrophic moral decisions, and you're so concerned about them. That's exactly what happened to Lot. Lot was dwelling in the midst of this horrible city, a city so terrible, God condemned it and overthrew it with a great destruction. And that's what we read in verse 6. Verse 6 says, And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, into ashes. Well, when you read this in the Greek text, the Greek word really is turning into ashes. And the Greek word means to completely reduce to ashes or to incinerate, to incinerate. You could translate this, God incinerated Sodom and Gomorrah. But the particular Greek word that is used is used by the Roman historian Diacassius, and here's how he used it. Diacassius used this very word to describe the inner rim of Mount Vesuvius that was constantly growing brittle. From time to time, the brittle ridge would collapse and crash down into the deep throat of the huge volcano until eventually the entire top of the mountain collapsed and settled into the throat of the volcano and disappeared under the ash of the volcano. That is the word which now Peter uses. So now we know that God reduced Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes. He incinerated them. The ground where they were located became so brittle that like the inner rim of Mount Vesuvius, eventually it collapsed, it settled into the earth and disappeared. Now it's interesting that where this took place is where the Dead Sea is today. And the Dead Sea is the lowest geographical spot on planet Earth. There's nothing lower than the Dead Sea. It's filled with salt. It's filled with sulfur. It is a living memorial of God's judgment of sin. God took sin as low as sin can be taken. He incinerated it. The Dead Sea is a living example of judgment in the past. And this verse says, it is a reminder of a coming judgment. In fact, look at the rest of verse 6. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them. That word condemned is the Greek word katakrino. Kata describes something coming down. The word krino needs to judge. When you compound these two words together, it's a judgment that came down. It is the condemning verdict of a court. Or heaven ruled that Sodom and Gomorrah did not deserve to exist. This was a condemning verdict of heaven's court. Heaven condemned them, judged them, brought them down with an overthrow. The word overthrow is a Greek word cataclysma. And yes, it's where we get the word for something that is cataclysmic. This was really a cataclysmic event. And the Bible tells us that it is an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly. Ensample is a strange King James word, better to translate it example, but it is the Greek word hupodegma. And listen carefully to what this word ensample, example, the Greek word hupodegma, listen to what it means. It describes a sculptor's small scale model of a statue or monument. Before the sculptor made the larger finished product first, he experimented on a small scale model, which he meticulously worked on to make certain each measurement and dimension was correct. When the small scale was proportionally exact and met the stiff artistic requirements of the author, he then took the small scale model and amplified it into the real final product, or it describes a prototype, which means the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah was an experiment. It was a prototype of the judgment that is coming in the future. That's what the Bible means. Just like a sculptor, before he makes the big statue, first he makes a small one. He measures it. He makes sure that it meets, meets all of his requirements. And when everything is perfect, then he amplifies it 
and makes it into the real deal. I have a prototype, a statue made by a very famous Russian sculptor. It's very small, it's perfect in every way, and they used that small sample to make big, big statues which were replicated and they were put all over Russia during the days of the Soviet Union. According to the Bible, Sodom and Gomorrah was God's prototype and one of these days in the future God's going to take what happened at Sodom and Gomorrah and He's going to amplify it He's going to make the final product or the final judgment. If you want to know what's going to happen in the future to the ungodly, just look at what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah because it was the prototype of a coming judgment. That's exactly what this verse means. So if anybody tells you God's not going to judge the earth, they haven't read 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 6. But look at verse 7. And God delivered just Lot who was vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. There was Lot living in the midst of all this horrible sin, a city full of sodomites, all kinds of sexual sin and sexual perversions, and a lot, a righteous man, living right in the midst of it. In fact, 2 Peter 2 verse 7 says, just lot, that word just, the Greek word dikaios, is the New Testament word for one that is just or one that is righteous. You could say by Old Testament standards, he was a saved man, but he was not living like a saved man. We already saw in Genesis chapter 19, verse 1, he was sitting in the gate of the city. He was one of the city leaders. He was woven into the fabric of sin in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, this righteous man, not living up to a righteous standard, but God delivered him. That word delivered, oh, it's a wonderful word. It is the Greek word ruomai. The word ruomai means a last ditch effort to save someone who's on the brink of destruction, or it means to snatch. A better translation would be, God snatched righteous Lot, who was vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. What does the Bible mean when it says he was vexed? The word vexed is a Greek word, katapaneo. This is a very important word. Peter now gives us insight into what kind of life Lot was living. The word katapaneo means to wear out, to tire, to break down, even to torture, it describes a person that is so worn down, so exhausted, so defeated, they throw in the towel, they surrender, they yield, or to bring someone to a place of total and complete exhaustion. So Lot, living in the middle of all of this sin, has become vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. He's thrown in the towel, he's surrendered, he's surrendered to it entirely, he's yielded to his environment. And the Bible says specifically to the filthy conversation of the wicked. The word filthy is a Greek word aselgeia. The word aselgeia in scripture always denotes unbridled, sensuous living. The word conversation, the Greek word anastrophe, which denotes lifestyle or behavior. When you put these two words together, filthy conversation literally means unbridled, outrageous, sensuous behaviors and lifestyles. That describes the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. They were sensuous. They were outrageous. It was ungodly behavior. And in fact, the Bible says the filthy conversation of the wicked, the word wicked, is the Greek word athesmos, which describes lawless people, people that are morally displaced. These are people that are no longer living what is right. Morally, they're confused. It's exactly what we see in society today. People have rejected the law of God. They've become lawless. People are morally displaced. People are morally confused. And where people are morally confused, they begin to do things that are incorrect, out of place. That's exactly what this word means when it talks about the wicked. Then in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 8, Peter continues. For that righteous man, again the Greek word dikaios, that just man, that righteous man, Notice the Bible says over and over and over, Lot was a righteous man. He just wasn't living very righteously. Just like that person you're concerned about. They're saved. They know the Lord. They've had a walk with God, but they're not walking in what they know. Lot was like that. He was a righteous man. But notice where this righteous man was dwelling. It says, for that righteous man dwelling among them. That word dwelling means to live among and to feel very comfortable there. He had become comfortable in the environment of sin. And notice what else the verse says. For that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing, vexed 
his righteous soul. That word vex is different. This word vex is a Greek word, basinizo, which means to torture. He tortured his righteous soul. And how did he torture it? In seeing and hearing. And here we find the process of callousing your soul. In seeing and hearing. The Greek says, in seeing and seeing and seeing and seeing and seeing, in hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing. You know, when you first see atrocious sin, it grieves your heart. When you first hear horrible things, it's so grievous. But when you see it and see it and see it, you begin to adapt to it. When you hear it and hear it and hear it, it no longer bothers you the way that it once did. And in seeing and hearing and seeing and hearing and seeing and hearing, he vexed his righteous soul, or I like to say, he calloused his righteous soul. He calloused his righteous soul. I have a callous on this finger. This callous developed when I was a young boy in the first grade and I was learning to write. And I would press so hard with my pencil as I was trying to learn to write my letters of the alphabet that I calloused my finger. And can you imagine, now decades and decades later, I still have that callous on my finger. And when I was a child, I had no feeling in that callous. I still have no feeling in that callous. But as a child, I thought it was funny. And so I would take straight pins in the presence of my friends, and I would stick the straight pins through the callus, and then would wave my finger in front of them and show them that I had no pain in my finger. They were all amazed by that. Why didn't I feel pain? Because I had become so callous, I had lost the feeling in my finger at that point. That is what happens to a person's soul when they continually see and see and see what is grievous, or they hear and hear and hear what is atrocious. At first it's so grievous, it's so terrible to hear, but when you see it and hear it and see it and hear it and see it and hear it, you begin to lose the sense of how terrible it is, and in fact you can even become a participant in it. It's like a Christian who once refused to go to movies that had sex and bad language. It grieved their heart. But now, over the period and process of time, they've seen so many bad movies that now they can sit there and watch the same thing that used to really grieve them, and now they don't even think about it. What's happened? They've calloused themselves in seeing and hearing and seeing and hearing. This shows how important it is that we don't see and hear wrong things. And the Bible says he vexed his righteous soul. The word soul here is the Greek word suke which is the New Testament word for the soul. It describes the mind. It describes the emotions. We're not talking about his spirit. He was a saved man, but his soul, his mind, his emotions, it became tortured. It became twisted. It became calloused by seeing and hearing regularly wrong things. In fact, the Bible says he vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Unlawful is the Greek word anomas. This word unlawful, the word anomas, means without law, the word nomos, which is law, with a privative at A, means without law. No moral standard. It pictures people who possess no fixed moral standards, void of standards, without law, or living in a state of lawlessness. They're not living by the law of God. They're not living by the word of God. They have concocted their own standards of what is right and wrong. It's very much what's happening in society today. And the Bible says he vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The word deeds is a Greek word, ergon, which pictures actions, deeds, activities, behaviors, and it can also encompass beliefs. These wicked people were doing wicked things and actually believed it was all right. Why did they believe it was all right? Because they were lawless. They had no law. They had no righteous standard. They had concocted their own standard of what was right and wrong. They weren't living by God's decree. They were living by their own politically correct standard that they made up for themselves. And they said, all of this is okay. All of this is acceptable. It's just our choice. But it was lawless. And in fact, it was so wicked, God destroyed them. Listen to what the Bible says in verse 9. The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation. Lot was delivered from this mess. He was delivered against his will. He did not want to be delivered. The word delivered here again is the word ruomai, which means to deliver someone who's on the brink of disaster 
It means to snatch, the same Greek word rumai, which we saw earlier. A better translation would be the Lord knows how to snatch those that are on the brink of disaster. And particularly, it's talking about godly people that are not living very godly. In fact, they're living in the midst of temptations. This word temptations can describe temptations, adversity, or trouble. And the Lord knows how to deliver them out, the Greek word ek, which means literally out of their trouble. Now quickly, let's go back to Genesis chapter 19, verse 24, where we find out what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. It says, Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven, verse 25. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew up on the ground, verse 27. Look at this. And Abraham got up early in the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord, or he went back to the place where he had negotiated with God for Lot's deliverance. Abraham had gone to sleep. He had slept all night. He hadn't worried at all because he had stood before the Lord. He drew near to the Lord, and he had the Lord's promise that Lot would be delivered. Look at verse 28. And he looked. So there he is standing on the brink of the hill, looking down into the valley where Sodom and Gomorrah once was. And he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah, toward all the land of the plain, and beheld, and lo, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace, or it was incinerated. It was gone. Verse 29, and it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain. Now listen to this verse. This is so powerful. This is really the crux of this whole teaching. And it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which the Lot dwelt. God remembered Abraham. We've already seen the previous program. Lot didn't want to leave. His family didn't want to leave. The angels took him by the hand and dragged him out. Lot and his family were kicking and screaming, I don't want to go, I don't want to go, I don't want to go. Yet the angels said, you're going. They took them by the hand and dragged them out and set them out of the city so they would not be consumed in the overthrow. Why did the angels do this? This verse tells us God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the overthrow. That is the power one person has when they draw near to the Lord to pray for those who are in trouble. And it may be that you're concerned about somebody and they're not even concerned about themselves. They may not realize how serious their condition is and they may not even want to change. But if you'll draw near to the Lord and intercede on their behalf, God will move on their behalf for you, just like God remembered Abraham, God will remember you if you'll draw near to him and negotiate on their behalf, intercede. God will deliver those who are in trouble. Even if they don't want to be delivered, he'll do it for your sake. That's what the Bible says. We're out of time, but I'll be back in just a moment, and I'm going to pray for you. Do you know someone who is making wrong choices? Are there people in your life who have walked away from God? What do you do to help someone find their way back to Jesus? In Rick Renner's series, How to Intercede for People Who Are in Trouble, you'll learn what to do when someone you love needs Jesus. Everyone makes mistakes, but what do you do when someone you know or love continues down a path toward destruction? The Bible tells what to do. Pray. In this powerful series, Rick uncovers the principles Abraham followed to pray for his nephew Lot that saved his life and led him out of sin. Available in digital or physical formats, starting at just $10, you'll discover how your prayers can shake heaven and be effective for those you love. When you call or go online today, you can also get the companion book, The Gift of Forgiveness. Life's too short to harbor bitterness. That's why forgiveness is a gift you give not only to others, but also to yourself. Forgiveness frees you and others to move on without being encumbered by unfinished business. Available for just $7, the gift of forgiveness will help you step into freedom and move forward with God's plan for your life. Don't miss this special offer, How to Intercede for People Who Are in Trouble, and or the companion book, The Gift of Forgiveness. Call now or go to renner.org to order. Get these two powerful resources today. Call or go online now. Friends, this is Rick Renner. Now, right now, 
I am in the interior of the Moscow Good News Church. It is quite an amazing place. When you walk through this building, it's so beautiful and it testifies to the grace of God and the provision of God and the giving of our church and of our partners. We built this facility debt free and because of that, the Moscow Church has never had the burden of monthly payments. All of our funds have been released to do the work of the gospel. And now we need to do that in Tulsa, and I call this Phase 3. And I'm asking you today to pray about joining us as part of the giving team for Phase 3, which is paying off the Tulsa facility. And the reason we want to pay it off is because then it will release funds for us to take the teaching of the Bible to the ends of the earth. And dear friend, right now, the Bible is so needed. And I know that that's my heart and that is your heart. And together, we can take the Bible to the ends of the earth. So please pray about joining us for phase three to finish paying off the Tulsa building. And I want to say thank you in advance. In Genesis chapter 19, verse 29, the Bible says, And it came to pass, when God destroyed the cities of the plain, God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in the which the Lot dwelled. That word dwelled means Lot was dwelling there very comfortably. He was at ease. Lot had no intention to leave. Yet the angels grabbed him and his family by the hands and dragged them out, set them outside of the city. Why? Because God remembered Abraham's prayers. Abraham stood before the Lord, drew near to the Lord, interceded on behalf of Lot and his family. And even though Lot really didn't care to leave, God delivered them because Abraham prayed. That is how much power you have in prayer. Don't diminish the power of your prayers. If you pray, if you draw near to the Lord, God will deliver your spouse. God will deliver your child, your grandchild, your coworker, your Christian friend that is strayed. God will do it for you, even if they don't want it. If you draw near and do your work of intercession, God will do it for your sake, just like he delivered Lot because of Abraham. Wow, that is how much power you have in prayer. By the way, I'm speaking to you from my series, which is called How to Intercede for People Who Are in Trouble. It's the last day we're offering this. And we're also offering Denise's book called The Gift of Forgiveness. And if you need somebody to pray with you, please call us. We're here for you. We're waiting. We would love to put our faith with you for the deliverance of those you know that are in trouble. And in the name of Jesus, I speak the word of encouragement to you today that you go to your knees in prayer, that you call out in faith believing for deliverance to come to those you know that are in trouble. In Jesus' name. Thanks for being with me. It's been great to be with you this week. Remember Ecclesiastes 8.4, where the word of a king is, there's power. Let the word of God work in you. And I'll see you in the next program. If that teaching helped you, would you please subscribe, like, and comment so more people can see it.